Gee, if you take any longer, I might forget the story. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I uh, lived in New Jersey in a town called Bloomfield, Bloomfield, New Jersey. In those days, we had a high school football championship year after year after year. And most of the towns hated us. But um, I played in a band, and that was great because I got into all the games free. And um, I was a lousy student. I would never do homework. And I failed many things. Matter of fact, it took me five years to get out of school, get out of uh, high school. And I, I finally graduated January of 42, finally. I think that the teachers were tired seeing me around. And uh, I always told anybody, how come you're still in there? And I said, the, the teachers like me so much that they don't want to see me go. So <laughs> they kept me around. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. I uh, got a job, believe it or not, and uh, my mother insisted that I go and start college. So I went down to Newark College of Engineering. <laughs> what a crazy school. It was tough, as you can imagine. And... Uh, I was started in September, I, even though I got out in January, but I got the job. So now I'm working the job, and I went at night in the fall. <clears throat> Along about the end of October, um, a lot of us, there was a bunch of boys in our area, and we, you know, we were there to play games and do things and sit around and talk. And the battle's going on now. <clears throat> the United States is now in war. And we all talked because the draft is coming and we were figure that we're all draft age 18. So <clears throat> we got to sitting around talking about well, we're going to have to go in the service. Uh, what are we going in the Army or the Navy? Or, and so me, young kid, you know, the rah-rah type of thing. And I said, the heck, the Germans really didn't do anything to us yet because we hadn't gotten into it yet. And the Japanese actually attack us. Who did they think they were? This is me talking now. And uh, I said, the heck with them. I'm out doing the army. The Marines are out fighting the Japs. <coughs> so I'm going to join the Marines. Only one other guy out of about, there was eight or nine of us there, <clears throat> and said, okay, I'll go with them. So he and I went down this time. They all went in eventually, but an army. So this fellow and I decided to go down and join the Marines. So we had to go to Newark. Now, Bloomfield in New Jersey is a suburb of Newark. <clears throat> and um, so we had to go to Newark, and there's a building there where all the recruiting offices were, and the Army and the Navy and the Coast Guard and someplace else, and then the Marines were at the end of the hall. So, two of us were walking down the hall, and I was uh, out in front of him, and I went all the way down because you had to go to the end of the row. I went in and left the door open when I went in to the Marine recruiter. And uh, I went in and the desk was in the back and I walked up to the desk, 
you know, and he said, you're here to join the Marines? And I said, I am, myself and my buddy. Well, in the meantime, I heard one of the sergeants that we passed get up and close the door. So I decided, yeah, I'm going to join it. So I turned around to, his name was Alvin. I said, Al, can... he wasn't there. I said, didn't a, buddy, a guy come in with me? And the sergeant that closed the door said, no. I said, you're kidding. And I said, <laughs> I'm sure they began to think, who's this nut that came in here? I said, you wait a minute. I had already signed up. I went out and I went down the hall and I didn't see him. I looked and all. He went in and joined the Navy, that rat. And so we got, I went in there, and uh, I walked in. He's still in the office. I walked into the office of Davy, and uh, I said to him, Al, what are you doing in here? You were supposed to join the Marines. And they're all the, 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 the swabbies there. They were all laughing and said, sorry, we saw him, saw him first. <laughs> and he decided... He wanted to join the Navy rather than the Marines. But I joined that day, and they said, okay, this is now in November. Well, it was the last week of October. And they said, you will get a card of when and where to report. And uh, I did. And they told me that November 10. I would join. Well, in the meantime, the day we signed up, my parents didn't know anything about it. So he and I came back. I went in and told my parents, my mother was furious. And she says, why did you join the Marines? My God, they fight all the war. I said, that's why I joined them. I said, I'm in at the Japs, and I would, I want, I want a chance to go out and get them. Oh, boy, she was mad. And uh, my father says, but look what you're giving up. You just started college at night. They didn't know that was one of the reasons I joined. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, I got a card in the mail at the end of October to report November 10. To me, it didn't mean anything. It just November 10. And that day, I uh, reported my dad did take me down to Newark to where it was and dropped me off. And there were about 30 of us that reported. <clears throat> and uh, it was November 10, and they put us in a, one of the marine vehicles, and they took us to New York City. I said, this where we're going to train, you know? We're all talking here. What's this? We got out in New York City, and they marched us to the Treasury Steps in New York City. And that's where we were. Treasury steps, we've got a picture here someplace, maybe and we'll get to show you after. <clears throat> and that's where we sworn in, and they had a picture in New York Daily News, the biggest newspaper down there. Right there, that they had taken a picture, and there I was in the front row, <laughs> being sworn in. And uh, it, uh, it was in the paper the next day. And they they cut it out, and I have a picture of it someplace around. And I'm, you didn't give me a chance to get everything together. <laughs> and so I hope Linda knows where it is. So anyhow, um, we after we got sworn in, there were about 30 of us, as I said. And then they put us on the train. And I remember it was the Jersey Central. And then they switched over to any. We got on. Now, we were supposed to, they told us, 
They told us we would be stopping in Washington. We'll be going right through Washington. But we'll be stopping at the restaurant in the train station in Washington. Typical. They got on the wrong track. And they ended up in Virginia almost to, to um, Richmond. And then they realized that they were supposed to have stopped in Russia. Would you believe that they backed the train all the way back to Washington to get on the right track and they got in there to the restaurant? By the time they got there, the restaurant says, what are you doing? And he said, well, we're supposed to have not anymore. We reserved the time and you didn't show up back to civilians and we don't have room for you right now. <clears throat> so we had to get back on the train, but what did we do? We ran through the thing and took all the rolls off of all the tables. <laughs> and that's all we had to eat that day. And we went all the way down to South Carolina. I'm trying to think of the name. I can't recall the Paris name. Paris Island? Or the well, that's where we were going. That isn't where we stopped. Then we had to get aboard a truck. And uh, the cattle cars, they called them. And we had to stand up and about 45 minutes from there into Paris Island, and that was the start. When we're going in, we passed guys working out and, and uh, cutting the lawn and stuff like that, and they're rubbing their head, because you take your hair, you know, rubbing their head and they're hollering, you'll be sorry, you'll be sorry. <laughs> so that was the start of our time at Paris Island, and they told us immediately there will be no, uh, no liberties while you're in boot camp, and uh, you will, and you will, and you will, and you will, and, and this is going to happen, and that's going to end it dead. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And uh, then it, I mean, it was something else. And in the Army, they tell you about this. I'll explain why I'm saying this. They tell you about this, and they tell you how what jujitsu is and how to do it, and they have guys up on the stage and you know, and all the guys, the, the uh, draftees are in there, and all this, and they explain all this. Well, in the Marines, you do it. And when you learn jujitsu, they pair you off. and. It's you against him, boy, and it's and if they you're taking it easy or something, they got DAIs watching you, and they'll come over with a wham with their stick. I forget what they call it, and um, you learn that uh, when like jujitsu and stuff, two guys flying through the air. <laughs> oh my God! When you graduate from boot camp, you get five days home. Well, it took me a day to get home and a day to get back, so we had three days home. While I was home, I had a cousin who was in the Army at Fort Dix, and he happened to be home. And they had liberty every night while they were in boot camp, supposedly. So... <clears throat> He's there and he's bragging about all this, how tough it is, and oh boy, and they really got. I said, Did you uh, have jujitsu yet? He said, Oh, that is enough to that boy. That's easy enough. I said, Really? You want to practice? Sure, sure, I'll take it. So I got. All I said to him is, Okay, stand by. Next thing you know, he was flat on his back with my knee in his stomach. He says, okay, okay, okay. My father was sitting on the sofa there reading a paper. And when he heard me say, okay, you want to practice it? Sure, sure, go ahead. He put the paper down and he watched. And I just moved into him and 
well, as I say, he ended up on the floor with my knee in the stomach, and my father never said a word. But I looked over, and there was a big smile on his face, and he put the paper back up. <laughs> and I said, well, I thought you said you had that. He said, well, he told it. I said, didn't you practice? Oh, no, no, we don't have time for that. We got... I said, what are you talking about? You don't have time for it. That's what you're there for. Well, they didn't have time yet. So anyhow, when we got out, <clears throat> we had five days off. That's the last leave I had in three years. Bad enough. I got home when we finished boot camp. I got home for those five days. And um, the next time, we were still, oh, we were in North Carolina at Camp Lejeune. My wife, my girl, who was going to be my wife, my girl um, wrote to me and said that on a Saturday night, their, their graduation is Saturday, and... <clears throat> That Saturday night, they're going, the graduating class is going on a boat ride. They have these fancy boats that go up the Hudson. And they go all the way up to Albany on the Hudson River on this party boat. And she said, a class night is going to be a boat ride. Do you think you get home on that Saturday? This was about two weeks ahead. And I... And I don't know. I, I wrote and I said, well, tr I'll try. I went into the captain was our CEO. <clears throat> I went in to see the captain. And I said, my young lady is uh, graduating Saturday. I gave him the date. And <clears throat> she has asked if I could possibly be there because th that night and they're going on a boat ride up the Hudson. He said, really? He said, uh, what town are you? I just see graduating, and I said, Bloomfield. He said, no kidding. He said, I'm from Chatham. Now, that's about 10 miles from Bloomfield. And he says, I, I, when he said Chatham, I said, oh, really? I said, my wife's, no, wrong, my mother's brother lives in Chatham, and he says, really, what's the name? And I said, Earl Land. He says, no kid. He says, he's one of my best buddies. I said, you're kidding. He knew him, and he helped him when he built the house. And he says, okay, when do you want to go? <laughs> I said, well, uh, Saturday, if I could get out maybe Friday night to get up there and be there for the graduation. <clears throat> he said, I think that could be arranged. Now, I want you back here at 6 o'clock on Monday morning. I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And that was about a week or so ahead. So I, I wrote to my girl and told her that, yeah, I'm going to make it wow. And uh, I did, and, but Friday, um, the first sergeant came and got me from whatever we were doing and said, the captain wants to see you. And I thought, oh my God, he changed his mind. So I went in to see him and he says, it's uh, nothing, <clears throat> all I'm telling you is when you finish what you're doing, this afternoon, you no more lineups and stuff. You don't have to do that. You go and change your home, get, uh, change your clothes, and get out of here. I said, yes, sir. Boy, well, I had everything ready anyhow. And so I did. Boy, did I get out of there. And I get, got to the train in time. And anyhow, I got home Saturday morning. And... My girl was working in town, and I took a, I, 
at the, the train to Newark, and I got on the bus to Boonville. Got off, and, and she worked in a doctor's office in um, town. <clears throat> well, I got off the bus right in front of where she was working. So I put my suitcase down there. Well, it was a sea bag, really, but... And um, I put it down outside the door and very quietly opened the door. And she was filing or something, and she then heard the door, and there I was in. And, you know, and when I, she turned around, and she went, whoo! And the doctor was, had a patient in there, and he came running out. What happened? What happened? And then she, he looked at me and said, oh, okay. And he went back to his patient. <laughs> And uh, so he, then when he finished, he came out and he told her, you can go. You don't have to stay to the end. And so uh, she and I uh, got out and she had a car there and we drove home. And that was it. And we went on, the, of course, I was in uniform at that time. And we went on the boat ride and we had a ball. I mean, to, uh, so, wow. so, but I, I definitely didn't know at the time, but that was the last liberty I got. And, um, not liberty, I, I got liberty. Uh, yeah, leave. And uh, no such thing. For three years, you said? Yeah. Well, you see, we were there until August, in this in November, and then boot camp. And so it's about January or February, we're back 13 weeks from the boot camp. And then <clears throat> I, I, we were in North Carolina. And we left North Carolina in August. And from then on, of course, I never got home and I never got furloughs. And of course, then. August of the same year, that was 43 now, 41, 42, yeah, 43. We went to California and uh, Camp Pendleton. And we trained at Camp Pendleton, continued our training, put our division together, <clears throat> and we left like the 31st of December, we went aboard ship. Little did we know we went aboard ship not to go overseas to some base. We went there directly into battle. We were the first military unit that went directly from the state into battle. First military unit. Of course, we had been told of what everything, and we had been training for this, and we went to the marshals. And uh, so I got through that all right. And then <clears throat> we got from there, and we went to our rest base. Would you believe our rest base was on Maui in Hawaii? <laughs> but don't forget, it was a military establishment. We didn't have the run of the island, except at night. And they, they began to limit us because uh, they told us we had to be in at 6 p.m. If we were on liberty, it certainly during the day, unless you had special permission, that they gave the island back to the islanders at night. <laughs> we were allowed to be there during the day. But uh, that, was, that was a nice place, nice place. Of course, I've never been to Hawaii since, but oh well. That was a nice place to have a rest base. And after every battle, we went. And <clears throat> Kahului is their uh, Navy base. Or no, I guess it was just a base for ships. And... Uh, we left from Kahului each time and we went directly from there into each battle. And then after the battle, came back. And uh, 
Well, uh, the Red Cross were terrible. They had two girls there that thought they, they, you know, heaven was made for them. They were supposed to do things for us, they wouldn't. They were supposed to give us stuff, and when we went over to get some, and they said, oh, we don't have some. Well, I, we knew that. We cards, you could hardly read them. We had played so much shuffling and everything. And we went over to get another deck. Oh, we don't have any. We don't have any. We knew that they had a warehouse because we had loaded and stuff. They had boxes of it, but they just wouldn't go get them. And uh, that wasn't the only thing. I can't tell you what crazy things they didn't do. And we came back from the Iwo Jima. We got off the ship. We hadn't been back. Yet. Got off the ship and we had to walk down, oh, maybe a hundred yards from where we got off the ship to where the trucks were waiting us to take us. <laughs> and halfway through, here was a Red Cross, uh, what they call them? The, they had the sides down and they had coffee and donuts and stuff there. And we thought, oh, look at that. They finally got it. And they're finally going to do something for us. And we went over to get some coffee and donuts. They wanted five cents for coffee and 10 cents for a donut. We just came off the battlefield. You're going to get money coming off the battlefield. Ah, you can't have it and next you got to pay for it. Oh, man. And more Marines came up and then they're giving us all this. One of the guys said, if I were you, you'd get out of there. And said, we're not going to get out of there. And there's about eight of us. And I was one of them. Uh, we got underneath it and we start rocking them. And you want to see how fast they got out of that. And we tipped the whole thing over. Officers were walking down the chair and he said, smiled and went right along. <laughs> Never said a word. And these girls, oh, you're going to pay for this. You're going to pay for this. And I said, we already did. Because we, we were coming back from Iwo. And this, when this happened. Mm. Now, uh, when did you know you were, you, you went right from the States into combat? Yep. And when did you know you were going to be part of the landing at Iwo? Board ship. Oh, Iwo. Yeah. God, they hadn't even thought. That was the Marshalls. Okay, yeah, that was the Marshalls. Iwo's in 45. Later. Right. This, I went in in, in uh, 41. Yeah, 42, I think you said. 42, yeah, I went in November 42. 43, 44, 40, I think it was uh, the last day of 43 that we left, and at 44, <clears throat> when we left, we thought we were going to a base when we left San Diego. And when we were on the briny and deep over there, you know, um, they told us we're on our way into battle, right from the States. First time ever that a military unit went directly from the States into battle someplace. And there we were, and uh, we had to go over the side on those rope ladders down the side of a ship into a little LCBP, they call them land vehicle personnel. And um, <clears throat> uh, we go out a ways, and there's about eight or nine of these LCBs going like, and there's a command ship. And they had gone around and around and around, and then when the flags went down, the first one just went straight out like that, and then the line, when they all got lined up and they all turned around in the line, 
when the flags went down on the command ship and off we went. And that's how we won every battle. That's how you get to, to shore. And then when we got ashore, we knew where we were supposed to be. We had seen uh, mock-ups of what the beach looked like and aerial photographs of what it looked like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, <clears throat> it seems that one regiment hit Roy, another regiment hit Namor, Roy Namor in the Marshall Islands. And uh, the 23rd Marines, 20, 24th Marines and the more, and the 25th Marines, which I was in, had all the little islands off the side. And I said, little, well, I think the island we were on is about as big as a football field, maybe. Uh, maybe a little bit, a bit bigger than that. And we landed 200 guys on there. <laughs> and then we went running in with the rival cock, you know, all ready to shoot the Japs in the way. Damn Japanese island. This was the little island that we were on. Yeah. There wasn't any. Now, what do you do with 200 guys on an island? <laughs> what do you do? I mean, you can't go any place, you can't do anything. And it was a, had been a storage island for Jap bombs and uh, torpedoes. And there we were. Well, they weren't cocked or whatever they call it, you know, they didn't have the trigger mechanism on them. So they were safe enough. We didn't know that at the time. God, we get it on and see all these things laying around. Didn't know what to think. When they told us they're, they're okay, they're not fused or anything. So we were in the, we have your head on the thing as you slept. You lean up against one of the torpedoes. <laughs> but, okay, you put 200 guys on an island like that. What do you do? We were there for over a month while they, they took those. And then what they did is they sent the 23rd back to rest base. And they sent the 24th back to rest base. Rest base. Now the 25th, they said we didn't do anything. They, they did all the fighting. So they went back to rest base. We stayed there to garrison the islands for a while. The 22nd Marines, which is a regiment that was off, oh, I can't lost the name of the island, but they were fighting there. And when they finished that, they were coming back to garrison us, and then we could go back. Well, they're having a little trouble there, and they didn't come back. We were about two weeks on this island. <clears throat> Roughly 200 guys. But he, there we are, and, and yeah, the just us in the island. <laughs> we, you know what? We played kick the can. You, you've heard of the game, right? So we we took a bunch of guys that wanted to play, and we divide them up. You know, where you could hide. <laughs> so the guys that were protecting us and everything, you know, they they. And, their guys here and the rest of them went out to pick us up. Now when you play it at home, it's just you go touch somebody and they have to come back with you. Not here. You find a guy, you gotta take him back. Now don't forget, he's a trained killer. <laughs> we all were. Oh my God. You should have seen some of the scenes. <laughs> Finally, the officers made a stop. Would you believe that we all just howled? They said, we're not going to let you do that anymore because somebody is liable to get hurt. <laughs> we just roared. Oh, my God. Then we, so we couldn't even play that. So what the heck did we do? What did we do? 
Okay, there were about five of us went off on one side. There's a little sandy beach there. We couldn't go swimming because the coral was a danger. Uh, you get, you rub that and it, it's, oh, they had a name for it. And it would not infect you and you wouldn't, you know. So they said, you can't go swimming and so on. So there we are. Well, there were five of us, I say, we sit around and talk and stuff. And all of a sudden, we were only about 50 yards or so from the moor. And we saw the corner of the island and they were beginning to put cans, pile cans, a whole great big pile of cans, dark green. And one of our kids says, hey, you know what that is over there? And he said, that, that's how they sent the food in, in those cans. Oh, challenge. Then we see a guy sitting on the top of the pile there with a rifle on his lap. He said, what the heck? And they hollered over, well, what are you, what are you doing over there? You, all the Japs are dead. He <laughs> said, to keep the Marines away from the food. <laughs> so, challenge, yeah. So, we worked it all out. Two of the guys waded across, and it was about, when the tide was out, it was about waist deep for me. And, uh, of course, I'm only a little guy, five, six, so. Anyhow, two guys waited around and went to the other side of the island and went over the other side and talked to the guy on time. The other three of us waited over, all grabbed a can under each arm, and back we waited. We managed to do the whole thing. Three of us, so we had six cans, right? And we brought it back and then finally went around and we got their attention and we said, no, come on back, we got them. And so they did and then he came back. There we sat. Now, who's gonna get the first one? These are all food cans. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, I, I, Linda says, how the heck did you figure out numbers? We, we each had a number. I don't know how we did it anymore. So number one, he got get a can, but nobody else could open one until number one. We had a little, you may have seen the, the little can openers. P38s? Yeah, that yeah, you could flip them. back and forth. You had to work that thing all the way around to take the top off. <laughs> well, and the rest of them couldn't do it until the one got this on, and you swore your fingers were going to come off by the time you got it. So he got it, and this guy, and the first one I remember was a can of peaches. Oh, boy, the rest of us, we couldn't wait, you know. A second guy had something edible and so on. I was number three. So when it was my turn, I went over, grabbed the can, and, and it takes you forever to get around. And I ripped it off, and what do you think I had? Sauerkraut. I had a can of sauerkraut. They called me the sauerkraut kid for about a week. <laughs> oh my God, that was so, that was funny to them. It wasn't so funny to me. I worked my fingers to the bone and I get sauerkraut. Okay, there were only five of us, right? And how many cans did we bring back? Six. So there was a can left. When I, I don't remember what that can was, but I got that one. And uh, it was edible, that's all I can remember, but I don't remember.
but a mansion he called me the sauerkraut kid. Oh, oh God. Classic. Yeah. And then, what are you going to do with them? You can't just sit there and eat kind of, I get a little bit and stuff. So we dug a hole, got them trenching tools, you know, dug deep holes and buried all the cans. So I keep telling anybody, if you get to the Marshall Islands and you go over in this corner, the little island there, there's a bunch of cans down there if you want them. <laughs> so there we were. And we were there for 20-some days. And uh, finally, they let us back, and we got back in the uh, rest base. And um, <clears throat> that we landed in January first, And um, we were there till the end of them. We, we got back to the rest base about in February, beginning of February. And we were there and just getting used to the place. And guess what? All right, tomorrow we're boarding ship. Oh, my God, we just got here. Um, this time, we're in a convoy. We go back aboard ship. We're now in a convoy. They tell us 22 miles long. And we're on our way to Saipan. Boy, oh, boy, that was some rest. So... Okay, so they gave us, and there was a certain period every morning. Oh, we had to do exercises. We had to climb ladders and over the top and down again and all this until the captain got wise, and he says, get off my equipment. You exercise on deck. Because he didn't want anybody falling or getting hurt or something, and he said, so, um, okay, but we did exercises aboard, and uh, just if we were back, back at our base every day. <clears throat> and then part of the day, um, we uh, got a briefing on what was coming. And then the rest of the time, you could stand on the rail and look out and never saw so much water. And what do we do? What the Marines do? And they, they, they sing. Believe it or not, they swing, they sing all the time. And uh, <clears throat> later on, battles later, we had uh, a whole regiment of the Negro Marines with us. Most of our group was either from New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, or Ohio, all northern states. Negro, so what? We didn't care what color you were. They were just one of our, but they were segregated, you know, until they, they went out on deck in the fantail. And I was one of the first ones I went over because I heard them singing. And boy, could they sing. And so I wandered over, and pretty soon I joined him, and I met one of the fellows that I knew because he had lived in Newark. And I uh, had met him in the recruit depot and stuff, so I found him. I said, can I sit in with you? Oh, come on, we'd love you. And you guys want to come? I went back and said, hey, you guys want to sing with some singers? Come on. And I took about seven or eight of us, and we went over. And boy, they were glad to see us, and we had a ball. And we all sang. What kind of songs? You have any Anything. Yeah. And, and we all, of course, in those days, we knew all the words. Right. Or if you didn't know them, they'll teach you. And pretty soon, uh, almost all of our guys were there too, and then the, the Negroes came out with us, and they, the, the uh, Swabies didn't say anything, and we all we did was sing. It was great. We sang anything we could think of. Some song we sang two or three times, you know. 
but sing. That's what we did. And uh, that was great. And the other, um, the other, the only other story I'll tell you about is on our way back from, uh, no, now where were we coming back from? Maybe it was from Tinian, and we were coming back, we were aboard ship. I, I, I should have written down the names of the ships, I don't remember any of them. But <clears throat> we had, in the meantime, gotten a whole swab uniform. And there were three of us. Dick Sullivan, he lived in Long Island, and, and uh, Eric Erickson of uh, Portland, Oregon, and myself. We were in tents. It just so happened every time the three of us were in the same tent all the time, so we became good buddies. And uh, so we'd... Uh, I lost where I was going with this, but any uniforms. You said you had. To oh yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. So we had, we didn't go down below. They were eight high or something like that, and, and people had to step on them to get up. So we slept on deck. I never once slept down in the in the sleeping area. We slept up on deck. Well, in this case, coming back from Iwo, uh, we had gotten, in the meantime, Navy uniforms. We had the little round hat and the T-shirts and so on, uh, pants and that. And we managed to smuggle them over. And at night, we were in the hallways and it was a rug in the hallway because it was a converted um, sea liner, whatever they call them. So we would sit and all night, we sit there and we'd play cards. And, and at midnight, now here this fourth unit, or uh, fourth something, whatever they call themselves, Chow. Well, I, we were in the fourth. So we put on the Navy uniforms and off we went. Well, we found out this was a brand new ship. So this is their, what they call a practice run or something. And from they just came from Seattle. And they were on our way to base. They pick us up to take us back to the base. So anyhow... All we did, nobody went in those things. We took off our regular uniforms, left them in the hall, put on a Navy uniform, and we went and got in the chow line. Well, these guys are brand new. They Half of them didn't know each other. They thought we were part of the crew. Fortunately, they never asked us what our duty area was. So we had chow at at uh, midnight and around four or five o'clock, it was a coffee hour and for the Navy, which we got. <laughs> and then we got to know some of the guys pretty well. They thought we were part of the crew. Didn't make any difference to us. <laughs> we get in chow. <laughs> so we had chow then. And then when it was Marines turn, we just changed our uniform. <laughs> We went down. We had chow again with the Marines. So it was a great trip back. And that was a trip where we ran into these um, Red Cross guys. And boy, you don't want to talk Red Cross to the Marines. And it wasn't only us. Mm -hmm. And they did this to all the Marines. They, they, and one of them said one, one time when they said, well, you know, and they say, who are you? We get, we go out with the officers. They have the jeeps. We, they take us out at night and treat us and stuff. Don't talk Red Cross and Marines. Now, difference? <laughs> when we came home, of course, board ship, 
we landed at San Diego. We got off, went down through, and here in the area, I forget what they call it, were card tables with guys sitting there. I think there was a couple girls sitting there too. What were they doing? They were um, They weren't Red Cross. They were, oh God. Maybe Salvation Army? Or one of the Salvation Army. Yeah. They were the Salvation Army. And what were they doing? They would send two telegrams any place in the United States for each guy. One to your family and one to your girl or whatever. And they were pretty much all you just had to fill in the spaces, right? But all it said was, we were home. Mm. And they sent those out free. Now, what do we think about this Salvation Army? <laughs> Red Cross. <laughs> <laughs> and boy, we sent them back, and it was great. It was wow. great. So, Neat. I can't think of anything more. Well, I'd love to hear a little more of, of Iwo, uh, if you have time. If you need a break? No. No, but I don't know why you got coffee and I didn't get any. Oh, I know. That is pretty good. Well, maybe that was for him. I don't know. <laughs> no, that was yours. The first wave landed at 9 o'clock. Yeah, fourth wave. And it was five minutes between waves landing, okay? So we landed at 9.15, and so we went in, and we are running up, and I got a picture someplace. See, I don't have a big cut. <laughs> I don't know where it is. Maybe Linda knows. Um, <clears throat> anyhow, um, our Jeep was in the, in the LCVP. And they drove off, and when they drove off the ramp, the wheels sunk to the hubcaps. And they couldn't move it. And there the Jeep sat in the, in the surf. But we ran up not far. And boy, the next thing you know, we were digging in. But only for a few minutes until we got organized and we would field telephone, and we had to set up the switchboard on the beach. <laughs> so we ran up maybe another 10 feet or so, and um, it was a big shell hole. And I had the switchboard, wouldn't you believe? I, it was hard carrying it, 75 pounds because my knees kept hitting it. So what did I do with it? Put it up and sat it on my helmet. And I went running up the beach. And somebody said, you what? And I said, well, why? I had to carry it. He said, do you, can you imagine this target you made when they saw you coming in with something on your head that must have been valuable? But I, I made it. We came to this, and the two of us, who was other switchboard operator, jumped down in the bottom of this hole, and that's where the switchboard ended up. Now, the rest of the team, there were three of us on the switchboard. I was in the front. Eric was in the, in the back on the, with all the terminals. And Sully was grabbing the uh, wires that the guys are running out to the uh, teams. The, the, um, the guys are doing the fighting. And uh, so they'd say, K Company. Yeah, we were in the third battalion. K Company. And Sully would grab it, hand it to Eric. Eric would take the coating off of it and take the wires and there were eight little wires in there four 
steel wires and three copper wires, uh, four and four. And, oh, really? Do you trust me with that, honey? You're no, that's all right. I can talk in this. All right. So. So you were talking about the copper strands. Your copper now, strands and. All right. Now to put them together, you try to intertwine the steel. They don't bend. And um, so you try to just get them together. The copper bends. So you wrap the copper around the steel ones. To get it together, and then you we had a we had a, a, a um, off our belt we had the pliers for taking the covering off and so on and cutting uh, uh, lines when you need to. Well, uh, Sully would get him there. Eric could take off the thing and and put him on the terminal. And then he'd holler to me. What terminal was and what and on the flap in there when they ring in the flap goes down. Well, on that flap uh, they're all up, and he said K and all that, and that that was K. So when we got all the wires in, now we know where each wire went, and L company and and M company and so on and and. Uh, Beachmaster and the shore party commander and so on, you know. So we had all those down, and then I sat with a headset on there and then uh, answered all the phone calls and everything. And then we checked with the Beachmaster to make sure that his line was in it was. And he had in charge of all the dump, the food and the ammo and the fuel and, and so on. Well, he knew where they all were. On the other hand, down the beach, not too far, but down the beach was a shore party commander. He was a Navy officer. And he knew, he, I, I must have had a book or something with him. He knew what was on every cargo ship out there. And if uh, we called uh, six, I remember in particular, sixty millimeter mortar was running short on ammo, and they called the beachmaster. <clears throat> we need, uh, we're sending a couple of guys down. They need sixty millimeter um, howitzers, um, um, mortars. And he said, okay, well, I'll get them ready. And um, two guys would come down. Well, uh, they had to call over to the Beachmaster and tell them they are coming. Now, the Beachmaster running low. He has to call to the shore party commander and said, we need 60 millimeter mortar ammo. Okay. Now, he knew where it was, what cargo ship. He got a hold of the ship and said, we need some, get your LCVP out there and bring them in. He had to tell them which beach, because they're all different beach numbers. Yeah? Well, I, I landed on Yellow Beach 1, and I know, on, on Iwo. And uh, <clears throat> so, now they had to come in and find those beaches and land the thing, and that's what a lot of their Negro troops were doing was unloading this stuff for us and getting them to the dump. Mm. And then our fellows would come down to the dump and get them. And it was very efficient. Boy, I'll tell you, they had that working like a clock. It was a great. So um, that's what we were doing. We were sitting in the hole. <laughs> mm. <laughs> a little lucky for us. Um, what, was it um, was it difficult to hear with all the noise of battle and everything trying to run the switchboard? I had a headset clamped on your ears, both ears, and I and I had a little thing that went up to your mouth, and that that's how I answered. And uh, when the Flip went down, it was say K Company. Um, 
and they tell me who they want to talk to, and I just collect them and connect them to them. And that was great. And I, re <laughs> I remember one. Okay, I have been on. I I had um, midnight to midnight to noontime, twelve hours. We worked twelve hour shifts on the switchboard, and so I had just come off. It was midnight, and um, I worked noon to midnight. And uh, I just come off the thing at midnight, and my other buddy took over. So I crawled up out of the hole, and, and some of the guys were laying out there and just talking and stuff. And so I joined them in and talked. Excuse me. So anyhow, oh, I would, it was only over there a couple of minutes, and... All of a sudden, the voice from the switchboard operator says, K Company's out, which meant, you know, was K Company. And that meant that somehow the line got broken, whether Japs did it or Shell did it or whatever. <clears throat> we had to go out and troubleshoot it. So, the, the lieutenant was up there and he said, okay, who hasn't been out running today? And they looked at all the guys, well, that's all they've been doing. I was sitting down there at the switchboard. And the, funny, all the eyes turned to look at me. <laughs> and so I just looked around and I said, yeah, okay, I know, it's my turn, okay. So, <clears throat> I get my stuff and then I'm gonna need to fix a wire, and I said, okay, who's going with me? Now, we learned from the early battles, Guadalcanal and Cal Caledonia and so on, <clears throat> the Japs used to cut the line, and then they'd sit and wait until somebody came to fix it, and they'd shoot them. So, we sent two guys out, and one guy is only duty was protect mm -hmm. the wireman. <clears throat> so I said, okay, I'll go. Who's riding shotgun? Now the riding shotgun, his only job is protect the wireman. That's all. It has nothing to do with line. Now, how do we how do we find K Company? We go down to the switchboard to the terminal, K and grab hold it and run it through your hand. And that's what you do, you follow that line and that's how you know you're on K Company. And um, the thing was, we were running up along there and I see a couple of bodies coming down toward us and I said to the guy with me, down. And we lay there and they come down and I, Boy, the last thing you do when you leave your foxhole is you know what this, what the uh, word is. Of course, we're no, not your passcode or your pa pa yeah password. Uh, pa password. Yeah. Thank you. You know what the password is, and boy, you better know it. And uh, because Marines are known for oh, bang, who's there? <laughs> 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 so, uh, you better know the password in a hurry. Okay, so we're going up, and as I said, here comes two bodies down. And we're thinking, oh my God. So I put my hand back to the guy behind me, and I said, get down, get down. And we waited until they got close, and I said, who's here? And they said, Marines, 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 and they gave us a cross right now, okay, coming down. They were from a different outfit. They're checking in different, and they're, we're 3rd Battalion, and they were 2nd Battalion. And, and so they're down looking for their break, and um, so <clears throat> this is very strange. 
if you are back in the back of the line, so to speak, you're very near the beach, and you're getting a lot of shells and mm. so on uh, all the time. The front lines go up there. They don't get so many, so much of the shells. They get small arm fire, machine gun fire, rifle fire, and stuff like that, and they get used to that. They're coming down to our section. We're going up to their section, and we get to talking very quickly, and we decided we didn't want this. So I said to them, how about you troubleshoot our line, we'll troubleshoot your line. <laughs> they said, that's a good idea, a good idea. So they did. We told them who it was and what and switchboard and what all the code words are and everything. We were February, Federal Blue Shore Party. That was our code name. And um, so we took their line. They told me what it was and everything, and we followed their line along. And um, so they fixed ours, and we went to fix theirs. We get to the end. I, I was out there, and uh, Lieutenant, oh, I forgot. When when I said, okay, I'm going, I'll go, I'm no problem. I know it's my turn. And <clears throat> so the guy that goes with you is in charge of getting extra wire because when you go out to fix, you don't know whether a shell landed on the wire and you're going to have to replace a whole bunch or whatever. So <clears throat> that's his job. He's got to get enough wire, and he gets it in a circle and puts his arm through and carries it on his shoulder. So I said, okay, you get the wire. And now he knew what he had to do. And so he did. He went and got wire, put it on his shoulder and everything, and off we went. And we went out quite a ways, and every once in a while you had to put, put your hand back to make sure he was still there, and he's doing the same thing. He's putting his hand out to make sure he's still behind me because it was pitch black. And, <clears throat> okay, now, how are we getting out there? We had the wire in our hand. Now, we came to the end. I stopped the lieutenant and I said, okay, you sit right here. Give me the phone. And they had the test clips on them and everything. I said, give me the phone and you sit here and take care of this end. All right. I went off hands and knees with all the other stuff, extra wire and so on. Um, went out, went out. I'm all over the place. And I finally found the other end of it. And of course I clipped on and I I just said, I forget whether it was B Company or something. Say, say I said, B, yep. I said, we're on it. Good. That's all. Because you don't ever ring a telephone, <laughs> especially at night. So it's just everybody is on all the time and never shut it off. And um, like the, every 15 minutes, you had to check all our lines, and we check K, L, M. You know, and that combination. So anyhow, um, <clears throat> I got on that wire and I checked and said, B? And he said, yeah. I said, okay, we're fixing it. And I just, very quick, we're on. And then he said, good. And so I unhooked it and I spliced that wire on. And now I un and unrolled, so to speak, back to the um, back to the lieutenant, <clears throat> and I didn't have enough wire. Oh no! And 
I said to him, and I, I put the phone down on the wire and crawled maybe from here to the living room. <clears throat> and uh, I called out to him and I said, you didn't bring enough wire. And he says, oh no. And this is a lieutenant, right? Mm. <laughs> and so I said, yeah. I guess we gotta go get some more wire. And he said, yeah, okay, I'll go. Now think of the Army. You think an Army lieutenant would go back to get the wire? He'd send you back and I'll take it. He went back to get more wire. In the meantime, I prepared this for spicy. Went back to where I had been and prepared that for spicy. He got back with the wire and he brought enough this time. And so we got it all back. And uh, <clears throat> now remember, this is not our wire, mm. but now we're connected back. So we call back to where our we got to our line. You know, I had the clips, I keep checking. And so then we went back to our base. And I'm thinking all the time, imagine if this was the Army. Number one, do you, you think it was going to be... Uh, an officer out there on this, mm. and he's going to go back and go, why? I don't think so. We all talked about it, you know, and everything. And it didn't make any difference. Rank in, in, in the Marines, rank meant nothing out in battle. Mm. I don't care what you were. And uh, it was name only, last name and never rank, and um, so it, it worked fine. And as far as we were concerned, it didn't make any difference what rank you were in battle. You were there to do a job and you knew what your job was and you better do it. And that's, mm. that's the way it was. And he was just one of the men. They forget he was a lieutenant. Yeah. Until you got back to the headquarters and stuff, that, that's different. But out in the field, it didn't make any difference. Now, you, were, you were there and you were a wireman. Yeah. Now, did you have any close calls with uh, with the Japanese? Where? No, but I don't know whether I can find it or not. But, um, one time, this was on Evo, I was uh, huddled down and we were being shelled. And I was in a foxhole. Thank goodness I was a little guy. But um, all of a sudden I heard a zoom. And that's just about what it sounded like, a zoom. And something hit the sand right there by me and blew sand back in my face. I said, well, what the heck was that? I'm looking around, you know, it's night, I'm looking around. <laughs> so I started digging where it went, and I grabbed something, and it was red hot, boy, did I let go of that. Mm. I waited a while, and then I went down, I got it. It was a piece of shrapnel wow. that was that close, it hit my earlobe. Wow. And then just just went past it, you know, and didn't do anything to it. And I dug it out, and I, th I think it's in my drawer there, and I'll get it as soon as I finish this. I think I'll get it. <laughs> oh, and uh, and how long were you on Evo? Until they said, "Okay, mm -hmm. um, we got it," and they came up. Now we can walk around, and they, they they were working on the caves, and they had groups that did the cave duty. We didn't have to do that because we were in wiremen and stuff. Yeah. So, oh, wow. Did you, did you lose any friends on you Do what? Did you lose any friends? You bet I did. As a matter of fact, on the Saipan, I don't know whether I can find that picture, um, Alan Jones was a private, first class PFC, 
like me. And he and I were a wire team, and it was us to lay the wire as we were going up Saipan. And the two of us were always together. We had an 85-pound drum between us, right? Mm -hmm. I'm 5'6", right? What do you think he was? He's six foot four. So the drum half the time is like this. He's up here, bent way over, trying to get an arm. But like this, we're, we're laying wire on this damn drum. Oh, my God, man. We had a lot of laughs with it and a lot of bitterness. But anyhow, we managed so he, we were together on Saipan. We landed on Tinian together. We were still a wire team there and everything until the end. <clears throat> he was Jim. He he went. Oh oh oh. Both of us were in different outfits, but we were in an outfit called Jasco, Joint Assault Signal Company, Jasco. And I was in the 23rd Marines, he was in the 25th Marines. 3rd Battalion, I was in 3rd Battalion, 23rd. But the company we were in, one of the things we did was um, they, we were available. If any, if any wireman got injured or something, they went back to the JASCO team. And we were immediate dispatched. So I went, I went, and then he went, and the two of us, he had come from the 3rd 25th, and I was in the 3rd 23rd. But we happened now to be a wire team on Saipan and Tinian. But uh, we, the two of us, five, six, and six, four, <laughs> they had more fun with that. Jeez. But we made it, and we all the way up to the end, and so on, and we landed on Tinian. We made it all the way to the end, I'll tell you, at the end of the at Tinian in a minute. But um, <clears throat> he, he went back, we went back. After the rattle was over, two battles were over, we went back to our original outfits. And uh, we landed with our original outfits. I was with the 23rd Marines, he's with the 25th Marines, 3rd Battalion, I, we have the 3rd Battalion, 23rd. Okay, <clears throat> I had to go out looking for something on Iwo. What the demo? I forget what I was looking for, but I got down to the beach and I'm walking along the beach to try and find it. And uh, met one of my good buddies who li lived up in New York State. And, but anyhow, here he is coming down looking for something and the two of us met. I swear we were there between five and 10 minutes just standing there talking on the beach. <laughs> never realizing where we were or what's happening, and, and it just so happened, nothing happened. We just talked about it, and he's telling me all the guys that we knew. He knew that I knew, and vice versa. And so I said, hey, how's Jonesy? And he was dead silent. And I said, what's the matter? He said, he was killed. Imagine. I spent all of Saipan and Tinian with him as my buddy. And he was killed on Iwa. Man. And you know, to this day, I don't, I don't forgive myself. I was going, when we got back home, he lived in right there by Los Angeles one of the towns right close to, there was a suburb of L.A. And I was going to go and see his mother 
that I was with him in two of the battles, and I was just going to tell her what a great guy he was and all this. Do you know that we got home, I got the liberty and everything, and do you think I could bring myself, I said, oh, I'm thinking to myself, God, what do I do? I'm standing there on the porch or something, and she comes to the door and hears a Marine and reminds her of her son. And, and I got all these weird ideas, and I never went to see her. And I never forgave myself for that. Never. I still hate myself for that, for not going to see her. But, well, you're telling this story now, and yeah, you, but you that's realize, you know. I just think of that. I think you're. you're oh, I felt I wow. for years I felt yeah. sorry, but you see, the other thing was I very, very believe it or not, seldom went on liberty. Hmm. Really. I had a girl at home. I mentioned her before. Remember, I went. I got leave to go when she graduated from high school, and um, she was my girl. And I was not looking for any girls. What do you got? What do the Marines do when they go on liberty? They're all looking for the girls. I wasn't interested. So very seldom did I go. Sometimes I would go just to see what what was going on, but that's it. <clears throat> but very seldom. This one time, as a matter of fact, it was a free, we came out in August from North Carolina to California, from Camp Lejeune to Pendleton, and. Uh, so I hadn't, this was August, this was October, I hadn't been out of Liberty yet. And all our guys, boy, they couldn't wait to get back to L.A. and then go into Hollywood and saw all, see all these beautiful models and all this, and pew. I had a girl. I know it sounds strange, but I did, and I wasn't interested in going on Liberty. I must have been Simon Pure, honest to God. I didn't drink, I didn't smoke, and I didn't go on liberty because I had a girl back home. That's commendable. I yeah, mean, holy smokes. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, um, so this one time, this Jack Scoglin, he was from West Hartford. He said to me, he was a good buddy of mine, he says, Come on out to Liberty with me. And I said, nah, I'm not interested. He said, look, I'll tell you what. I'm going to visit my cousin who lives in Van Nuys. And he says, I'm, I'm just going to visit them. I'm not going out on Liberty or anything. We're going, come go with me. And I said, well, if you're just going there, okay, I'll, I'll go with you. So I did. That was my first liberty in California, Van Nuys. <laughs> oh, do I remember that one? <laughs> Just as we got there, they were getting ready to go out swimming. And <clears throat> we said, of course, we don't have bathing suits. Now, his cousin's name also was Roy. The only problem is he was six foot two. I'm five foot six. <laughs> He's gonna lend me a pair of his trunks. And they, you know, we said, well, we can tie him on tight, you know. And we'd... so we did. And he had two extras, so I put a pair on. You can imagine, with me, boy, I tied it so tight I couldn't believe. And so off we went to go swimming get to the pool, and instead of wading in, right? What do you think I did? Oh, you dove. Yeah. And there was a diving board there, and I ran out on the end of the board. Boom, and what do you think? I got down there, and the trunks were up here. The women are absolutely hysterical. I came back up. 
and there my head poked up, and they are roaring. They're slapping their thighs and everything, laughing so hard. I had to go find the suit. You ever try to put a bathing suit on in the middle of a pool? Oh, 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 I'll tell you, they, I made their day. Oh. I really did. One of the girls said, oh, God, I got to sit down next <laughs> Well, I managed to get him get it on. Oh, trying to put the darn thing on again. Anyhow, I managed to get it on and get up out of there so I could tie it on. <laughs> I wouldn't go in any. They said, "Come on, wade in," and Joe, you know, stay in the shallow. Room. No way. I'm staying right here. Oh. God, and they never let me forget it. I used to get cards from them every day. Not every day, every once in a while and everything, but I made their day. Oh, that is perfect. Oh, oh I tell you. And the other thing was that instead of taking us in the bus station so we could get a bus back, they took us all the way back down to camp. Now, they lived in... Van Ice. I don't know how long, must be about 90 miles, something like that. But they took us all the way down to the main gate, and we got in from there. We were in a, a situation, part of the base, is, it was our largest base in Camp Middleton. It sits right in the edge of a Sledo Canyon, and we were in a, in a bunk. No, I, I, the uh, block house, no, not a block house. Barracks. The barracks? Barracks, that's the word. It's a, don't get old. Oh. Uh, barracks. So we were uh, right on the edge. And um, so 15 miles from the main gate. So obviously we're not going to walk in, and so we had to wait out there for some of the shuttle. I remember that word. And we shuttle back and took us back in, and uh, we made it. And one time they took us in, and I felt I had such a stomachache because they had taken us out for spaghetti dinner. And obviously, I overloaded uh, because all we had was marine chow and stuff, which wasn't bad at that pace. And um, so I went into the dispensary, and I said, "Oh, it's a stomach ache." I said, "Give me, I got an antacid or something there." Just so happens the doctor was there, and he says, uh, "Lay down there." I did. I, I looked at him. I said, what's the matter? And he pressed down here and let go all I got. And my hands and feet went straight up. He says to the, turned around to the corpsman and he says, get over to the hospital and prepare uh, for operating. We're, we're going to be get over there. And he said, get off of there and let's go. I said, what's the matter? What's the matter? He says, you've got appendicitis, and we better get you to the table. And he did, and he says, boy, you were lucky. He says, I got there in time, and I took out his appendix right there, imagine. <laughs> and then I spent a, two days in the hospital, and then I was out of the hospital, and it was a light-duty slip, which meant that they couldn't put me in regular duty. I... I could go out and pick up trash and butts and stuff like that. And um, so I, that was, that was uh, one time I went, that I got back and did that. But uh, the other thing from there was <clears throat> because we were on the edge of a canyon, they said, we had to post a garden every night, and it was a double-decker. So, he's out there walking, and they, I don't remember the time, excuse me. But 
But all of a sudden, <clears throat> Corporal the guard comes to check on the guard. No guard. So he, oh, he went in, he said he went hit the sack. He wasn't there. He went in the head. He wasn't in the head. Went and walked around and told you they couldn't find him. He looked underneath and wasn't there. He called the sergeant of the guard. It's a corporal guard. Mm -hmm. Called the sergeant of the guard. And they did all that again. No, God, no guard. He got the OD officer today. And <clears throat> the OD says, all right, we'll just rouse out somebody else to finish the trip tour. So he did, and um, he said he'll show up at roll call, and he didn't. He said, well, he's over to hell. Why, well, and, and he, we were 15 miles from the main gate, yeah, and nobody's going to walk out there to, to go on liberty. And so uh, no guard. And what happened to him? I don't know. Two days later, one day, and the guard's okay. Two days later, guard's missing. Second time, boy, and what's going on here? And they're looking all over, and they couldn't figure it out. Nobody wanted to go on duty, because yeah. <laughs> they didn't know what was going on. And I, I always remember the guy that got duty after the second guy was gone, he put his bayonet on his rifle. <laughs> he said, what are you going to do with that? He said, I don't know what's out there, but by God. <laughs> well, <clears throat> it was the fifth, I guess, between the fifth and sixth day, I think, all of a sudden, the first guy, by this time, they had gotten another guy, they had three guys. And what happened, I, I'm getting ahead of myself, the officer today was a punk, a lieutenant, he was one of those who used his rank all the time, you know. Um, so he's going to find out what's going on. He put one guy this way and one guy this way, and they figure he had to pass each other twice. And one night, they're both gone. And now uh, all the guys are saying, okay, where is he? And the poor officer, he didn't know. So they had now four guys. And um, <clears throat> so one day, they show up. One one guy, the first guy, came up with a stick with a handkerchief on it, and he came up, and um, he's we oh we ran over and said, where have you been? What are you doing? And he says I'll be right back. I got a message for the CO. So the captain he get, took the message to the cabin and came back out, and he says. The raiders, the marine raiders are practicing down there. And they're coming up, and what are they practicing? Taking the Jap guards. And so they're they're picking off our guards. And they had the guys down there with them, and they told them, you wait, right? we're not going to tie you up or anything, but don't you dare try to get out. If you do, and we get you, we're going to keep you tied up, and we'll tie you up to a tree or something. God knows. So anyhow, <laughs> <laughs> this guy comes up, and all he, they had a ransom note. They had now five guys, and they had a ransom note, and it, it says, if you want these guys back, this is what we want, and it was all food. You lead it on the edge of the cliff there, and we'll come and get it. But don't you put anybody there, or we'll come after you. Well, I guess you know they put the food out there, and they didn't bother him. 
And next day, all of them came up, and, you know, of course, we mobbed them because what was it like? What day? What happened? And they said, filled us in, and then they were practicing all this kind of stuff. And he says, they have a, a tree there with a board on there for throwing, knife throwing, and there was a line 10 feet away. And every time that one of the guys walked past it, they, he took his, his, what do they call it? And I forget, the canine or something? The K-bar. K-bar. And they, they'd take it out and then, and they'd stick it right in the thing. And they, one of them came over to one of the captives and said, okay, you throw it. And he said, Jesus, wait, I didn't even hit the tree. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, none of us ever stuck it in there the first time. One of the guys could do it. Yeah. Uh, they have the five. And then the, the, the uh, um, uh -huh. raiders yeah. laughed, you know, God. Yeah, that's not so great. But they, they got the food. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we got the five guys back. <laughs> Oh, oh I'll tell you, it's it, was, it was something. Okay, on Evo, we ran in. We were third battalion, and we ran in there. Eric and I had the switchboard, and so I got in the front, and he got in the back, and Sully, and our other buddy, he got the wires from the guys who were running it out to, to the teams, and he said what it was, gave it to Eric, Eric, Crimpton took covering off so we could wire them, put the wires together, and then tape them. Mm. And then Eric had to take the um, covering off so he could wrap it around the terminal. And then he would holler to me what the terminal was, K Company or L Company or whatever, the, um, Beach Master, or whatever the thing was. That's what I marked on that okay. thing in the, out in the front. I was in the front. And uh, <clears throat> so when we got done, and these, and we had to put the, I, I forgot this, we had stakes that we put in. And what do we do with the stakes? Okay. You take the wire from the with switchboard down, and they wrap it around the stake before they let the guys go off with that. Why do we do that? Because if it didn't, and it was just the wire into the, the switchboard, anybody walked by, kicked the wire or, or whatever, it would pull it right off the switchboard. This way, they kicked it against the pole. They couldn't pull it out of the board. And... Um, it worked, and, and that's what we did. Yeah. So, mm. Now, after the war, <clears throat> uh, you've attended reunions, mm -hmm. uh, and you've been doing that? We did them as long as possible. In 2015, they had the one down at Camp Lejeune, and that was our last one, I forget what number, because there were very few of us left. And I think they managed to get 60 um, at this one. I think that's what the number was. And they decided that that was the last one because it was too hard for these old guys to get to where the reunion runs. We had them in Portland one time. Mm -hmm. 1984. Wow. And you had a volunteer two years ahead, it gives you two years to, to prepare, uh, that they would accept coming to wherever. Well, we were all over the country, of course. So they're coming to Portland in 1984. And they told us, the headquarters, to expect about 1,200. <laughs> 
1,200. I'm, the reason I left Portland, 1,200 coming in. Where are you going to put them? Mm. The Eastland only has 100 rooms. Mm. And that's our biggest hotel. Or was then. I don't know about now. Wait a minute. I'll take that for you if all the way. Thank you. So, okay. We set it up. We got a post office box. And the post office box was uh, the date and stuff. You know. <laughs> it worked out very well. So, um, they told us to expect... I forget what I said now. 1,200, I think you said. 1,200, yeah. Told us to expect 1,200. We completely booked the, the um, Eastland. The little one up, just up the road, uh, was then uh, the genius. university took it over later, but we had it then. We had the, what was then the Ramada on the way out of town. On, mm -hmm. and, I can't think, Congress Street. Okay. And we had another one out by the airport. And we figured we had enough room to cover. They told us we expect 1,200. Okay, we hoped that we covered them. How many did we get? <laughs> we ran out of rooms. Honest to goodness, we ran out of rooms. We had every, every one of the hotels, we had the whole thing. And we ran out of rooms, so there's one on a street running out from Portland, Forest Avenue, <clears throat> and uh, they gave us 60 rooms, and we just needed them, absolutely. Did we get 1,200? No. We got 1,741. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said. Wow. We should do it. Now, one of the things, the one thing that stands out is we had to plan what we're going to do with them while they're here. You know, they do whatever we're going to have. You ever have a thousand out at a um, beach lobster, lobster feed on the beach for a thousand? He said, we can't have the beach. We had it anyhow, and we just took the, took over the beach, and he said, "Go ahead, run us off." And um, marines are marines are very good at taking beaches. That's right. Yeah, they did. Well, I never thought of that, but that's right. We took those, that beach, I mean, all the way from Cape Elizabeth right on down through South Portland, <laughs> and um, anyhow that and so on. And then at night. They had a choice to go down to Ogunquin, to the theater down there. They have a theater, a live, live theater evenings. And, or you could go on a bus ride through New Hampshire. We had 15 buses full. <laughs> so anyhow, that, at that time, our uh, racetrack was in full operation. So <clears throat> I went down to the racetrack and talked to the manager. And I said, I don't know. They had to pre-register when they wrote of how many wanted to go here and here. I told them we're going to have about 1,400 coming in here on Tuesday night. He said, no kidding. I said, yeah. He said, that's wonderful. I'll make sure that they all have a program free. By God, and they'll get in here free. I said, you got it. And we had busload after busload after busload came in, and they got there. 
and then you should have heard them. They were roaring out there. Okay, so what he did was he made the fourth race, the fourth Marine Division handicap. And he, when I talked to him, he says, I'll donate the cup, and we'll have it written on there, and we'll put the guy's name on that won it. And you just tell us, and we'll have the guy right here who would do it for us. Do it for us. <clears throat> so we got there that night. Oh my God, bus load there. I think it was 14 buses. And um, that they really crowded the track. And we got to the fourth race. Fourth race is a fourth Marine Division handicap. And boy, they off, and the guys are cheering and hollering. What do you think? Guess what? Number one, the f number four horse, wow. and everybody in the they're hollering, fix, fix, yeah. fix. <laughs> <laughs> and they had a, we had a our chapter president, national president went down to win a winning jockey to present the trophy to him for winning the race, you know, and all this. Say, hey, that was a big time. We had a great time. What a story. The guy, I went back the next night or later on and talked to him. He said, oh, that was wonderful. We had such a great, the jockeys were all excited and everything, you know, on the fourth race. And he's, and every, every, you know, they thought it was a fix. He said, that was not a fix. He legitimately won. And boy, that was something else. We had a great time. But that's, the, we had all kinds, of, and we couldn't find a, a, a place for our banquet. Now, they, a lot of people don't stay for the banquet, you know. But we had 1,200 that said they would be at the banquet. There was no, the, the one hotel in town, um, I forget which one it is now, said they could do it, but um, I happen to know one of the chefs. I said, could you take over a thousand guys? Are you kidding me? He said, no, they couldn't. He said, they'd have them sitting on each other's lap. Yeah. So we wouldn't go there. <clears throat> I went to the town and spoke to the mayor and everything, and they finally did. The, the, there's a place right near the ballpark, and they have a big what do they call it, where they can set it up for a, a thing and they could could like fit a, a in there. Catering? A catered yeah. place. And they had it all set up and they could do it. Wow. And so we did it there and the buses came and picked everybody up, you know, and, and brought us in there. Wow, that was something else. That was a great reunion. A lot of them said that was one of the best reunions they had. That sounds like it. Because nothing went right. And the other thing was, there were at that time two newspapers. Hmm. The Press Herald was in the morning, evening express. And you have to, we had an article and everyone, the whole week they were here, there was an article. My picture was in a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> Did I take a resin on that one? Oh. But uh, we had the stuff in there, and they were all very pleased with yeah. that all, every, everyone that came was. And uh, we pulled it off. I don't know how we ever did it, but I guess who was yeah. chairman. Yeah. And uh, But I had a committee in our whole uh, wow. Chapter 21 worked on it, and I think there were about 20 of us that had different jobs yeah. to do. Yeah. And I... Uh, how, how many, uh, how many 4th Marine vets are still around today? Do you, would you estimate? No. You don't know, probably. No, I have no idea. Yeah. I have 2015, 
they said not enough guys were coming to Reunion National to make it worthwhile for a group to get it, try to get everything set, and they didn't know how, and it would, they had to register that year. Right. <laughs> and say at the reunion was the last week of June or something like that. That interfered with a lot of the school activities. Yep. And a lot of them couldn't make it because their kids were in school and they're having a banquet or they're having a, mm -hmm. something. And so they, they called it off on 2015. But we had the reunion at the base, mm -hmm. Camp Lejeune. And when we went to the CO for that, God, he was so excited, he practically jumped out of his chair. You would bring the 4th Division here? I said, well, that's what we're asking you. He said, you know you're on the Marine Bureau, which, boy, did they go all out. When they put the flag out in the morning, you thought it was a national, um, national day or something, you know? They had a whole unit that came, marched out and put the flag up, and we told everybody, and we had a whole mob of guys there to watch. And they went through the military thing, you know. Well, believe it or not, when they were all done back and marching out, everybody's applauding. <laughs> oh, God, that was something else. Oh, okay. We had a CEO <clears throat> who was terrible. He certainly wasn't a leader of men. How he ever got to be a captain, I never know in our studio. And we happened to be in our, in his company. <clears throat> and he had certain guys that he would pick on. I can't think of what you call them. But he would, these certain ones, every time something goes wrong, it was one of those guys. And I was one of the ones I done. I was accused of everything under the sun, but and I usually did it too because I got so tired of being picked on all the time, you know. So <clears throat> this time, whenever they were going on liberty, and this is now in Hawaii in our rest base, and um, we had to march, get all dressed up. Not to when you're going on liberty, but a dress up. Every time on Liberty Day, we had to get to, and march out to the drill field where he had an inspection. And if he didn't like the way you are, he'd pull you out, no liberty for you today, no liberty for you today. Sometimes he'd just say the whole bunch. So, <clears throat> this one day, he gets down and he goes, you're checking the weapons, right? Now, I know this guy cleaned his rifle like, because he was always one of the first ones inspected. And we marched out there, Dirt Street, and um, it's Dirt um, um, Field that we marched in, uh, practice field and stuff. And... Um, <clears throat> So we went out, we got, and then you get into uh, inspection mode. So he starts out with the first, first one, and as I say, boy, I know these guys had, he said to that one, this right and right one is dirty. Put this man in report. The poor guy, he had cleaned that rifle. That was just as clean as it could be. Second guy, this rifle dirty. One more, he said, one more. And this whole unit gets canceled liberty. <coughs> a guy in the back row hollers, give me liberty or give me death. He turned around and he walked down there and said, who said that, who said that? The kid he just left said, Jack, who, who really said it? Patrick Henry. Oh, Patrick Henry, yeah. the kid back he just left said, Patrick Henry! <laughs> he stopped dead, turned scarlet red, turned around and looked. 
They never said a word. Turned around and went right off, it went right, down, right back to his tent. Of course, the first sergeant was with him. He had to go with him. Now, you know in the military, once you're in a particular thing, you cannot go out until you dismiss. Exactly. All right, there we were in <laughs> liberty mode. We couldn't move. We couldn't go anywhere. We could talk, but we couldn't move. Oh, Jesus, we were out there and laughing and uh, who said that? Oh, <laughs> Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry. Oh, oh my Lord. Oh. Yeah, and first, first thing you know, it was about 10 minutes later, first sergeant comes back and, boy, you did it now, boy, you did it now. And we just figured, here it comes. He says, you're not getting any liberty for three weeks. So we figured, yeah, so what? Uh, but he does that all the time. And so... That was one of our best stories in that. Who said that? <laughs> Patrick Henry! <laughs> what could the kid say? <laughs> and, I love it. I love it. and the officer never knew what to say, come back with. Nothing to say at that point. <laughs> oh, that was something else. So, anyhow, <clears throat> we had all kinds of. Oh! One time. Um, we had pyramid tents, you know, and they had frames. Mm -hmm. And lights out at 9 o'clock. And, I mean, they didn't say lights out and you better put... They pulled the plug. <laughs> and everybody's lights went out at 9 o'clock. Radios went off, everything, you know. So I figured, well, okay. So I went out and looked for a long board or a big board or something like that. Found one. Went and scrounged a couple of nails and a hammer. And I nailed it underneath the frame so that it stuck out like this. The tent went up like this. Here's the frame here. And I cut a uh, candle about this big. <clears throat> and I lit it because I used to write a lot of letters. My wife, my girl that ended up my wife, wrote to me every single day I was in service. When we off went off on battles and stuff, sometimes it was two or three months before we got back. And, and, um, mm. and when they got back, <clears throat> the guy that handled on the mail, he'd come down tent rows. He'd come to our own mail call and get the next one mail call. He'd get the RO Earl call because I had most mail. He, he was like this, Earl call. And they're all mine. <laughs> so, oh, those guys hated me. So, anyhow, oh, on the Marshall Islands, we were on this island with nothing to do, and they decided we should get some mail. They sent one bag in for 200 guys, right? And there were seven letters in it. Would you believe four of them were mine? <laughs> These guys said, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I looked at them. They were all from my girl. Oh. I said, no, you don't. Oh, come on. Well, the guys were all around him. Read us a letter. What would she say? What would she say? Let us read the letter. Oh, my God. So I finally read them all, and I decided there wasn't anything they couldn't see. But I took them out of the envelope mm. so they couldn't get the address and put that in my pocket, and I read it, and then I gave it around, and I said, okay, you make sure I get them back. About two or three days later, I got back, and everybody here had read their mail. I wrote to her and said, be careful what you say. Everybody's reading your mail. <laughs> she said, and left. she said, her father said, well, you ought to write a letter and tell them all about the town of Bloomfield where they lived. And uh, you could, you know, write a letter for the whole bunch. But she never did it. But, uh, Isn't that something? Oh, oh God, that was funny. I love it. Oh. So when you get back to the candle. So <clears throat> I cut the candle about that big, figuring I could write enough letters. Because not only she wrote to me, but a bunch. That's why I had some one. And I would answer as many each night. 
to get them off. I didn't write too much, but at least I answered their letters. And uh, I got another story, too, after that. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, she, uh, she would write every day, every day, and I'd get the mail, and every day I'd come back, and I'm, boy. Well, um, <clears throat> finally, I got a letter from, uh, I, I got two or three letters from people who say, what can we send you? Because I used to tell everybody, don't send me anything. We're out on these crazy islands. What can you possibly send me that I could use? I mean, they can't send it while we're in these islands because we had a pack. And, or, or maybe we didn't take the back. Huh? And um, so they had these two ladies in particular who kept writing, we want to send you something. What can we send you? And, you know, and I'm wondering what in the world. And finally one day I hit it. They could send me jelly beans. By God, what do you think? There's no jelly beans on it. In those days, yeah. they only made jelly beans July 4th and Christmas. And otherwise, there's no jelly beans on it. Well, this one lady was so incensed. She, went, she said, I went to four stores and they didn't have jelly beans. So we said, in one store, I went and found out where the jelly beans are made. And I wrote to the president of the company and said, what, in the ma what is the matter with you? You make stuff people like and you don't make them. And, and, you know, and she said, I really laid into him. And the other one said, I called the company and spoke to the president and said, and I don't know if it was the same company or not, and said, why don't you make jelly beans other than Christmas or Easter? And um, <clears throat> so he never thought of that or anything. Would you believe that within a year we had jelly beans all around the clock? And I like to take credit for the fact that I got jelly beans all year round. Now, when we were just out there, I found out where these places are made. Linda? I think she's on the phone. Huh? She's, she's on, on the phone. phone. On the phone, okay. I found out where the jelly beans are made. Jelly Belly, I think they called or something like that. And I have a thing that from the outfit. And uh, so I went this time, by golly, and I found out where they were made and I watched, wow, all the machines pumping out these jelly beans, jelly beans, jelly beans. And uh, I wanted to t her to tell you what, they pull out, you know, they'd have to run them through a thing that they went through. Wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, they'd kick out the bad ones, mm -hmm. you know, that were ill-formed Ill or whatever. So they have a, a place for them, a, the thing they called it. And so I found out where my jelly beans are made. Wow. My golly, Jelly Belly Factory. So, so was Ronald Reagan one of your favorite presidents? Because he liked jelly beans. Yeah, too. as a matter of fact, yes. There you go. He liked jelly beans. He had them right in his ashtray. <laughs> 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 okay. Now we found out jelly beans, and so the word spread. Guess what? Everybody that didn't know what to send me something, send me jelly beans. I thought I was going to have to get a separate tent. I gave him a bag after bag. They gave him all these guys. And then one of the guys said, enough, enough. <laughs> okay, when we came home, our um, CO you know, said he's not having anybody in his company take government property home. 
So we, he went to every tent. There were six in a tent. And we had to dump our sea bag on the cot. And she, he had to go through everything you had in the sea bag to make sure that we were taking, not taking government property. So he gets to mine. And he takes it like this, twist it out in the seat, and what do you think? <laughs> jelly bean, jelly bean. 20, 20, 20 packages of jelly beans in there. He said, what's this? And I said, well, what do you think it is? It's jelly beans. Don't get smart. Yeah. Oh, God. He didn't get one. Yeah. So he went on. I had a free pack, and I I go to give him out, and nobody wanted any. <laughs> I had to put them all back on my table. Oh, there you are. Oh, okay. oh, so better than sauerkraut, honey. Where where did I put the jelly belly stuff? That's a lot better to get jelly beans, I guess. Oh, that's, that's for point. sure. Yeah. I couldn't give either away. <laughs> yeah, you don't put jelly beans on your hot dogs. No, no. <laughs> so. oh, that is great. That's a neat story. We can thank you that we have jelly beans. Absolutely. Absolutely. I met the guy. These people are so mad at this president for not making jelly beans available. And within the year, they were available all year round. That is great. We had the same K rations. Oh my God, that's all we had, K rations. From the time we left the, the ship to land and all the battle, and all the way back, all we had was K rations, and they were terrible. So anyhow, um, we were there about, I'm guessing now, three or four days or so, and they finally got us all back there, and then they got us together, and they announced that, see that island over there? We had turned all our uh, artillery around, and we didn't need them to fire up in Saipan, so they turned around. Tinian was only three miles away. And so they were firing over, they had turned them around and they were using all of our weapons now to fire on Tinian. And uh, <clears throat> now they announced that, well, as long as we were here, this is the way they put it, we might as well take that island too. And there was second division, marine division, and the fourth. And um, <clears throat> so what happened was, the second division went back aboard their LCVPs. These are the little ending ships that we did. And they all went down, and they went down to the other end of, of Tinian, and they went out, out of uh, gun range, but where the Japs could see them, and all they did was to go around circles like we were getting ready to land, and that's what we used to do. We used to go and see it, and then they'd straighten it out, and they'd come in, and they called them waves, and uh, then they'd make the waves up. Well, they went down the other end of Tinian, and the Japs were there. They had about 7,000, I think, they estimate. And uh, so anyhow, um, um, the Japs thought they were getting ready to land down there. They took all our troops down that end. And they were down in Tinian Town, if you've ever read about them. And they had made fortification down there and everything to get them. In the meantime, 4th Division just crossed over the three miles. We went into the um, LCBPs that we had landed in landing craft vehicle personnel. And... Um, <clears throat> so we landed, and we put our whole division, about 20,000 roughly, uh, ashore before the Japs knew we were in the island because they rolled down the other end, and somebody must have tipped them off. So we had, in the meantime, gotten ashore, went in about a mile or so, 
and set up our defense in every battle that way I was in. Whenever we fought and set up our defense for night, we always fought until four o'clock in the afternoon. Four o'clock in the afternoon, we stopped, and we always set up our defense. And we had um, wire out there and the kind that had stickly, yeah. And uh, we'd put that out there. We'd hang cans on them and stuff. And we buried uh, mines and, and so on. We always had a, a real tough defense. And then we had our uh, 50 caliber machine guns out on the, the uh, ends, 30s in the middle, machine gun. In between, the automatic weapons, BARs, and um, so on. And we had uh, a rifleman that were around and so on. And in every battle I was in, not once did the Japs ever break through one of those defenses. Not once. And we stacked them up, boy, I tell you. Well, we set this up on Tinian, and we had to, we went in about a mile or so, and uh, <clears throat> we were all set that first day when they, we landed. We waited, and sure enough, about I'm guessing two o'clock in the morning, one two o'clock in the morning, in come the Japs. Screaming, hollering, bonsai, but they hit, <laughs> they hit the wire and they hit everything out there. And our gunners were just, oh, they riddled them. And uh, I don't, I've lost the numbers now, but <clears throat> none of them got through. And our machine gunners were sitting there and automatic riflemen and so on, and they were just, Measure. Did you want me? Okay. And um, <clears throat> so they just riddled them. Well, the next morning, all the way were dead Japs out there. In the section where I was, they counted about, about seven, eight hundred dead. And some of the gunners that were out there in the front said that they, the um, ja, the uh, ships were firing, and the um, you know they lighted up. They had the destroyers out there, and they um, I forget now my whatever the the shells that would burst in the air and make light. Star shells. Star shells, yeah, and. Um, <clears throat> That kept everything light so that we could see. And they said, um, well, I talked to one of the fellows who was up in the front there, and he says, oh, you can't believe it. He said, we riddled them as they come in. The ones behind them was climbing over them to try and get you know, over the dead bodies and stuff. And in our front, the front lines where we were, the next morning, <laughs> Before we started anything, he went out to count and make sure they were all dead. They were. And uh, in our particular area, there were uh, just between seven and 800 dead ones right out there. And they said they just kept coming and coming. We were worried about running out of ammunition. But he said uh, we took care of them. And he says, my God. So the next day, our outfit said, okay, we'll leave this for the um, backup. And we're going on ahead. And the backup had to count all the bodies and get them all out there. And they, what they did is they took a, um, the one that has a blade on, like it was brushed with snow. And yeah, the like a plow. Yeah. And... Uh, they just dig big holes, and they just hold the bodies in there, and then they covered them all up. 
So uh, anyhow, but we went on uh, ahead and to take the rest of the island, which we did. My attitude always was people have more fun than anybody. Mm. If you keep everything on the upper level, you're not going to worry, you're not going to fret and everything. It's going to happen whether you're... you're not. So why, why worry about it? Yeah. And that's my attitude. And I know a lot of guys didn't agree with me and they were scared to death. And, and then what did, what did they get? They, they came out of it okay. And so I said, see... But I did lose a bunch of them. <clears throat> but I, I never, never really worried about them. It's just, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Why worry? Mm. And that's the way my outlook was, and, and always on wow. upper level. And how how long was it until you? How long was it until you married your girl when you got back home? Um, I got home on Thursday. <clears throat> By Saturday, I had to, my dad. I had been in touch, and I wanted the ring and tell him to get it. And I had the money and everything, <clears throat> and he did. And so that Saturday night, I proposed finally. And I put the engagement ring on. And Christmas, I, I this was the end of November and the beginning of December. And then, no, it was December, excuse me, because Tuesday was Christmas. Mm. I gave it to her on Saturday. And she wanted to see if her parents noticed it on that Sunday, and they didn't, which she didn't like that very much. And so at Christmas Day, she went with my parents to see if they noticed it, and they didn't. <laughs> so she, she was most very unhappy with both sets of parents. <laughs> and she says... I know she said to one of my, my parents, we were both there, I guess, I don't understand. I'm going to marry your son, and you can't even notice. Oh, my mother was so apologetic, and oh, my God. My, she was so fucked up. And she knew, because this is my girl all through high school, the only girl I ever had yep. at that time. <clears throat> and they never noticed. Oh, <laughs> but they did after that when my when she used to come in she'd come into my house sometimes and my mother would be there <laughs> Linda Audrey was her name Audrey would do this to her <laughs> my mother would say yeah I know I know I know <laughs> <laughs> oh that's great oh oh, oh well yep and then you guys yep. got married after that uh, let me see, uh, July, uh, June, June 21st. Wow. First day of summer. June yep. 21st. Wow. Right there. And, um, I don't know where the picture is, but we, we went to London at one time, mm. and June 21st is the longest day of the year, mm. and, uh, they had a picture in London taken on June 21st, and we took a picture of June 21st in London, and we had it framed, and it's here someplace. And uh, so June 21st was my first marriage, and she passed away in 92 from mm. cancer. Mm. And she suffered, that poor girl. Oh, what a shame. And I was... This sounds very strange. I always had the girl. Mm. I never had to go look. So it just so happened that <clears throat> when my girl died, mm. somebody said, "Well, don't, don't, aren't you going to take another girl out?" I said, 
why. First, it was why I had a girl. Yeah, I know. Finally, I realized that I wasn't ever going to get her back. And somebody said, well, why don't you go ask a girl for a date? Do you know what? I did not, this sounds strange, I know. I did not know to, how to approach a girl to ask her date. Mm -hmm. And then I said, well, so we go on a date. What do you do on a date? Mm -hmm. Now that sounds stupid, right? I guess it is. But at that time, I never, ever had to worry about it. I always had a girl. And in the service, I never went out with any other girls because I had a girl. Mm -hmm. She's gone. Now, how do I get a girl? How, what do I do? Would you believe that I was alone and lived alone for seven years before this girl? And... Actually, we knew each other. My other wife and I knew her because she was treasurer of our state of our uh, church. Ah, okay. And uh, so we we see her every Sunday, uh, wow. and so <clears throat> we we would both talk to her and everything. When Audrey was gone, I would see her every and talk to her, and it took me almost four or five years before I asked her for a date. Boy. And I, my thing is, well, would you like to go to dinner sometime? And she says, well, I have to think about it, but yeah, I guess so. And we did. Wow. But we couldn't go any place around free, just, they were Freeport. Yeah. We had to go someplace where we wouldn't meet anybody, because we couldn't right. dare meet anybody we knew. that, yep. Oh. Well, isn't that wonderful? And then, yeah. finally, it, yeah, it was. She just, yeah, she is a doll. Oh, she yes, really I can is. tell. Yeah, mm. she is. You have been a blessed man. Both girls, man. I, I just couldn't like, like them any better. I worship them because they are so good to me. Both of them, mm. my former wife and this gal, and it's just uh, great. Absolutely great. I, I think it's... My first girl, I knew, I figured it out one time, was either 51 or 53 years, mm. counting when I knew her in school and everything yep. up, and she died in 91. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was up to... There's, I don't remember when it started now, and I don't remember how many days. Yep. Uh, I knew her in high school, and mm. that's where we really started to go together and wow. stuff. And she was in the band, and yep. I was in the band, and she played the sax, and I played the trumpet. The saxes are always in the front, a couple of rows in front, so I could always see her as we were playing. Wow. So, and whenever the band traveled, of course, guess who traveled together? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> So, oh, yeah. anyhow. Oh, that is wonderful. Well, I Thank must you. have taken up enough of your time. Oh, My God, you'll never get home. Oh, that's all right. We, uh, listen. Well, it's this still light. An absolute <laughs> honor to sit here today and listen to you. And, uh, well, well I glad you, I'm glad I you came. Just,